Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Fun. Hey there. Welcome to ATL and 29, uh, a podcast where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. I'm here with Glenn Willis recording after uh, Joe Prunty's victory number one as Hawks interim head coach. Glenn, wait, who's that? Hello. I see somebody else I'm here. I'm looking at the illustrious Brad Roland. I feel like I should have a stripe, like Foot Locker shirt on or something here with the two of you being on the same podcast or something, but you Brad Roland, how you doing? Referee. Hi, guys. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, for, for listeners that don't know this, Kevin will sometimes – just put the Zoom link in the Peace Hoop Slack channel, and I never get to jump in. And today, I decided it had to be done to celebrate the greatest coach in NBA history, Joe Prunty. <laughs> it is officially sure. Joe Prunty Palooza time. The modern Red Auerbach. <laughs> I mean, I, I I will say this: the man conducts a good post game presser. <laughs> I obviously was not. I was not there tonight. I'm on the road, which is why I'm doing this anyway. But uh, I so I got I I wasn't watching live, but I did get to hear it all and watch it all after the fact. And uh, there was a new pep in their step of the media, I think, as well. I think everybody just likes to talk to Joe Prenti, which is good. And yourself included, Kevin. He was he was not uh, he was not shuffling through cliches. He was he was processing and sharing and then sharing some more. And that that was uh, that was a change. And I get it, you know. I mean. He, he might not have a lot of opportunities to do this because things are happening, I hear. That's, that's, that's what I was going to say is that, like, have you ever been in a situation where you felt like, you know, this might be my one shot, you know, <laughs> so I'm going to get I'm going to give it everything I have, you know. That's why yeah. he wanted more threes. He, he wanted more. He, he said he wanted more threes. And I, of course, that, that plays to my heart just deeply. I just that was his one uh, salvo to me. I felt like that was a, a, a knowledge branch to me in particular. Just yeah. more threes, please. Yeah. Yeah. If his agent, you know, if. Well, there will be other job openings after the season. There always are whatever number. And if his agent is doing his job, if this is the only uh, game Joe Prenti is going to be the head coach for, those per game numbers are going to be routed to every single team looking for a head coach. I mean, no one could put put up numbers against what they put up tonight, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, where do you want to take this? There are a lot of things. Are we supposed to talk about tonight's game? Or are we supposed to talk about the future of the head coaching position in Atlanta? What, what, what is it that you want to talk about tonight? It's been a few days since we've we've discussed anything, Glenn, and, and things have happened. Well, I mean, you know me. I always love to, to break down the game and all of that. But, I, you know, I don't know, like, what's more interesting. I, f- I feel like we're all waiting for either Woj or Shams or, you know, whatever kind of news to break on is is there an actual agreement is there a projected time that quinn snyder's gonna gonna start is he going to like coach the next game is he gonna give himself to you know and and is it actually gonna get done done you know i I think i think i feel like including myself i'm kind of jumping a little ahead of things and, and assuming kind of it's gonna get done but we don't you know it's not done done so you know my quick uh kind of The game, my quick rundown, I'll let you guys kind of react. Number one is I feel like the the Cavs were not necessarily prepared for the Hawks to be so heavy pick and roll and so light and iso tonight. I feel like that was a huge part of kind of how the Hawks kind of really put together at least, uh, um, especially a magical kind of second quarter. Uh, The Cavs being good at defense didn't just kind of, you know, you know, fold up their stuff and call it a game. In the third quarter, they started blitzing the pick and rolls. The Hawks scored, I think, seven points the last six and a half minutes of the third quarter, and it opened the door for the Cavs. And the Cavs kept creating turnovers. And, you know, but there was, fortunately for the Hawks and Hawks fans, there was enough separation there. So there was still, even though it was kind of 
a blowout. The numbers said this is an interesting from my perspective, the way I watch the game, it was interesting to see the Cavs kind of recalibrate their defense, throw a lot of aggressive pick and roll coverage up the floor, and it worked. It bought them time to potentially kind of get back in the game. But as we always say about NBA games, when you dig a hole, you use all your energy to get back into the game, If and then it's hard to have energy to sustain that down the stretch. So that's my short synopsis, and I welcome your perspective. <laughs> I'm I'm just visiting. I, I just I just want to listen to you. All I wanted to be, all I want to do was just be able to listen to the podcast early. That's why I came on. Really, that's all it was. No, I uh, I agree with Glenn, and I I fl- I'm not sure if you guys did as well. I flagged that um, it was a little bit dicey when the Cavs were making their charge. The Hawks were kind of out of sorts, and there was that Chetty Osman missed open three that would have cut it to ten. And if that, if that goes in, it might be a different game. But I, I'm glad Glenn said that too because it's so hard to come back. And that's been, after the Hawks too. Like, there's been times when the Hawks have been down 25 this year, and they come all the way back to like, you know, take the lead or whatever, and suddenly the the legs are gone. And it's because it's really hard to come back from that. And that's why that, that's the, sort of the price, and in, in, in this case, the positivity of that first half. Like, you build a 32 point lead in the first half. There's a reason you don't blow that lead very often. It's because everything has to go wrong for you to lose that game from that point forward. And uh, you know, are they going to shoot like 100 percent from the floor like they did in the second quarter? Because I'm sure you guys saw that, Kevin. Did you see that too? The Hawks PR had it. Elias Sports Bureau had the Hawks like the first team in like five years to make 15 straight shots. Like you, you just don't make you don't make you don't shoot like that for any length of time. And then to have in the second half they scored seven points in ten minutes. It's just like one of those <laughs> uh, every single uh, spectrum of an NBA game happens tonight, I guess. But it, all it's, good. Like, it's like it's like my my daily productivity. Until about two thirty PM is awesome. Then after two thirty, I am straight garbage at getting good work done. <laughs> and so it's like it was like their game, their offensive game, kind of mirrored my like productivity kind of uh, curve for for a day. Um, but you know, the other thing, Kevin, was with Bay at the four, they were willing to stack, run that pick and roll, empty the strong side, empty corner, the corner. Yep, track three guys on the the we what would be the weak side and the Cavs were not ready for that at all that was that was the one thing they did differently apart from just kind of dumping the iso seeking the mismatch etc you know was loading up three shooters on one side empty in the corner and they got a million shots at the rim uh and that's how they got to a, what a million point lead or whatever it was that was the other thing that i i saw that is there any what else did you see kevin no i'm glad you brought that up because i made a mental note to ask you about emptying the corner and i had since forgotten it uh i don't know there was (laughs) there was the final minute of the first half when the hawks uh took whatever massive lead that they had and just gave them eight or nine points back you know trey tried a couple of shots for for entertainment purposes if you will they they were high degree of difficulty shots One was a two for one, so okay. It was, it one was, was a two for one. That's it was not a high quality. It wasn't a high quality two for one. No, it, it was wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't because it immediately gave them a, a a very good look in transition because of the way that it was missed. But yeah, I thought that was interesting, and it's so Brad, you know, yeah, uh, Brad. I had curious. I oh. thought with I thought with Bay. The power forward, you know, obviously the, the I think the one of the things they they would miss with JC being out is the rebounding help, right? Yep. And I I love that Jalen played with Anyeka a lot tonight. I think that's a great combination. Jalen's such a good rebounder, but I, you know, Hunter only got three rebounds, but he went in and threw his body around and just helped, you know, put a body on a body. And, and I I just thought his involvement and in his kind of being proactive and going there and kind of mixing it up, I thought I thought it was helpful. Wondering, and and that's not an area where he always <laughs> so. yeah I, I was gonna make, make that joke because you know i I've, i picked on him for sure by rebounding i, I agree i it, i thought he had more rebounds than he did which is probably a good indication that he was helpful in that area just as an observation and like they have to you know if you're gonna play hunter and bay those guys are not great rebounders in general capella covers up for a lot obviously clint is fantastic on the glass he's a one-man rebounding crew but the fact that they rebounded well the entire game and especially um, against this opponent that plays big most of the time to come out of that game playing small a lot. I mean, because I, I agree, they, they played Jalen and Eka a lot. It seems like that's just what they. I mean, obviously it's different. It's a different regime now, but I, I think no one wants, no one has wanted the last two regimes. If you want to count the Joe Prince era as, as this one game, they don't seem to like 
want to play Jalen and Clint together, which results in Jalen and Yeka playing together. And that, those guys fit very well together. But going small, you know, some of that trade off you would think would be on the glass, and it didn't really burn them at all. And, I think, and maybe that, maybe that's that's Dejounte was helpful in that area as he often is. And I thought, like to to your point, Hunter was very good there as well. And you saw the offense. I mean, our, our friend, our mutual friend Andrew Kelly was probably celebrating somewhere about the four out system that they were running on offense with uh, with Clint. Uh, just for everybody that doesn't understand, that Andrew's not the biggest John Collins fan anymore. But alas, here we are. I'm not. I'm not here for the uh, better without John Collins stuff tonight, guys. I'm not going to do it. But yeah. well, I don't know bad. how much time we have with Brad, so I want to get this question out while we do have him. Uh, Let's operate under the presumption that Quinn Snyder comes. Who? <laughs> Did I mess that up? I'm so tired. I'm, I'm kidding. No, I'm, I'm just you, kidding. You could mess with my head, and, and I would think that I said the wrong thing. So we, ha- we have, let's see, we have Landry Fields, who has about five years of G League and NBA executive experience combined. We have Kyle Korver, uh, who, you know, you can count his executive experience, I think, in months. And, you know, Nick Ressler seems to be actively involved and, you know, he's got a small number of years. He's a, he's a young fellow. Uh, if, if, if Snyder does come, does he get a lot more clout and say so than the average NBA coach? And if so, to what degree do you think that that ends up happening? Um, as far as the, I would, I would certainly imagine he gets more than an average coach and, we're still in the early stages here. Obviously we don't, we don't know anything yet. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to find out stuff like everybody else, but uh, you know, given what I, I think Sean's reported, it was an $8 million estimated price tag for Quinn Snyder. That, that's on the higher end. It's not the absolute apex, but that's a lot of money for a head coach. I'm sure it'll be a long-term deal if it gets done. And if you're Quinn Snyder, you know, you're in a position of power here. The Hawks clearly want you and you can probably negotiate for some more personnel say, I'm not sure if he's one of those coaches that just, wants to run the whole show. Like not every coach wants that, but some guys do. And I don't know if he's going to be the number one decision maker, but I think that it stands to reason given what you just laid out about just kind of the youth and the inexperience of this front office that a proven, you know, eight year head coach who, you know, this, this isn't everything, but he's kind of older than these guys, like just, just seasoning wise beyond everything, like just age wise, all that just experience level. I, I have to think he'll be in the room. I don't know if that means he's going to be the guy, but um, you know, there's a reason maybe that they've left that that seat vacant. I mean, they've had a, a president of basketball operations for most of the last, what, seven or eight years and either Budenholzer or Travis. And I'm not sure they're going to give him that job title, but Landry's the GM. And, you know, there's room above that. There's room to the side of that. And even I think you were there, Kevin. Landry left it open at his press conference. Like he was, he's not sure if there's going to be someone either to the side of him or even above him in the coming months. And maybe that's Quinn Snyder either in one of those spots and, you know, if it was a first time head coach, you're not going to do that. If it ended up being, you know, what Charles Lee or something like somebody who's, who's reported, but it seems like they're far down the, the hole on, on Quinn. I think that uh, bringing it full circle, I, I can't imagine a world where he, didn't, where he doesn't have any power. Like Nate was very upfront about like, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, that, that, that's those guys job. He always said that. And it was right. He didn't, he didn't have that juice, but I think with Quinn Snyder, it will, it will surprise me if he doesn't have that juice since on some level. I don't know if it's going to be number one juice or number two juice or one A or one B, but he'll have some power, I have to imagine. And it's, I don't know in what particular way, but it's like an ironic twist in the sense that that's sort of what Budenholzer got in Milwaukee after he left. <laughs> that the one, the one B where he's not the G, you know, the, next to John Horst, they have a, they have a GM, but. Obviously, Bud's in the room. Like very clearly, he's in the room for some of that stuff. Or versus the the Stan Van Gundy, Doc Rivers, Tom Thibodeau, uh, Budenholzer in Atlanta, where they're actually like they're the guy, and that honestly hasn't worked very well. If we're being candid, like yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I think the Budenholzer role is actually a better role, like a more functional system, where maybe he has a veto power, but you're not really giving him that job. It's just a different job. I mean, I'll yeah. let you guys talk about it more, but it, like. It's, it stands – if you think about it logically, being a head coach and being a president of uh, – they're just very different jobs. Like you're – it's the same goal. You want to build a contender, yeah. but they, short-term versus long-term, big picture versus small-term. Like it's just – they're very different jobs. Yeah, different skills, different daily activities, different – I mean, it's just – it's it's very, very different. But, but any – so to kind of take a step back and kind of capture the – I don't know – the consensus narrative around the team right now is 
perhaps there's an issue with the players embracing coaching, right? So that narrative mm-hmm. is there, right? And if you were talking to the organization about getting you know, taking this job, it seems like you'd want a, some leverage kind of built into your job description or whatever that might give you a little bit more uh, opportunity to kind of manage a situation like that. You know, that's, I wonder if kind of that's part of the conversation is, Hey, I, you know, I want it to be visible that I have say in decisions in the front office, if that gives builds in some sort of protection real or otherwise, you know, to kind of trying to be able to kind of manage, manage that part of the risk, you know, that's just something I'm curious about. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really, really good point that, uh, you know, I I hadn't really thought of it that way. And one thing I wanted to actually add to that is just sort of in describing the youth of the front office, you know, for, for years and years, and I would say maybe even decades, like the Hawks have had some old heads in the room. Uh, going back to like Rick Sund, uh, Larry Riley, Rod Higgins, like they've had some some uh, older consultants with decades of experience, and it's hard to keep track of of who's around right now. But I don't think they have that either. So in addition to sort of you know not having the president of, of basketball operations around, I really don't think they have like the senior advisor either. Which is again, uh, we could call this irony night. Like that's sort of the label they gave Travis Schlenk when they bumped him up. But I don't suspect that he's you know doing a whole lot in that role. He, he, he is not, by all accounts. I think. Uh, but no, <laughs> ceremonial, I, I, ceremonial role. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I'm sure people have varying um, evaluations of how important that old head is. You know, no one's th- saying Larry Riley was like making decisions when he was here. Like he was just a. It, it's a sounding board. It's having somebody who's been there before, and it's not even an age thing. But they are very young. You know, Landry and Kyle are very young. And I think they like that. I think they they're players, and they I think as an organization they're seemingly valuing that player. Um, that player angle and um, but yeah having someone who's been through the been through some stuff and, I, and I, we've talked about it offline I think as well but I kind of always thought even if no matter what they do with the coach or whatever they need to bring in another another voice and even if it's a Rod Higgins type or whatever just somebody else that's been there and done it and um, you know it's hard to do in the middle of the season but you go into the next year like I guess they flirted with um, uh, Chris Grant at one point it was, it was I think they kind of know when Landry said it like they know they're young and they're this is their first time doing this and having somebody that's been around like Quinn I, I think it was from reporting maybe Glenn remembers this um then I'm not sure wasn't there kind of like a power struggle maybe in Utah not not a bad one but like maybe in the behind the scenes like Quinn versus front office thing at the very end when Quinn ended up leaving and there was a little bit of buzz about that I'm not sure how real it was but you know that's just part what happens we have if you have different viewpoints it's just gonna um, having that can be good. It could also be challenging. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point about about the old heads. But you know, I just I have to stick up for the old people on behalf of Glenn. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I I'm, always I'm the young guy it. tonight, baby. That's, this is great. Yeah. I'm usually old. Uh, I'm, I, I, feel I, very I, I think tonight. I think I'm like 33 days older than Kevin or something like that, and it'll that will always be true. You know, <laughs> that's how it's kind of how it works. It will always be but, true. And listen, on a, on a night when Bogey had his legs, you guys should just feel very, very inspired by that. And that's an true. old guy got his legs back tonight. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Utah just kind of felt like, um, you know, I, I, I'm guessing there was maybe just not a consensus about whether they could take that group with, with some of the conflict that you, you heard about kind of off and on. Had they hit their ceiling, do they need to, you know, a big retool, a small retool? And I mean, it seemed like with the Rudy and Donovan situation, both, you know, wonderful players kind of in their own right, but it seemed like it was kind of an exhausting situation. And I mean, Danny doesn't exactly calm everything down, (laughs) you know, when he shows up, you know, so I just, it feels like it was kind of, uh, you know, a situation where there was a, a lot of uncertainty and I mean, my guess is Quinn felt like he needed a break, you know, and uh, and maybe he wanted to, to to try somewhere else next time, and maybe that's going to be, um, you know, a fortuitous kind of a way of things happening for for the Hawks here if they if they're able to do this. I do have a another kind of social media kind of question though. Um, you know, all of the jokes running around about Quinn, I I refer to him as being kind of sociopathic. You know, it's a lot of that is is. But is there any irony if they do this deal this weekend? Is there any irony that the Hawks will be hiring Quinn the same weekend that Cocaine Bear comes out in theaters? 
<laughs> let's let's not get ATL sued for libel when Vox is no longer our parent company. That's yeah, about the jokes going on on social media. I just think it's I, I'm just asking questions here, you know. Hey, let me ask you a question, and I think this is your favorite topic: assistant coaches. So let's, let's operate under the assumption <laughs> that uh, <coughs> Quinn Snyder comes and he goes to the bench immediately. Which I don't even know if that's something we should assume or not. But then, how does the assistant coach stuff work? Does he just he keeps his assistant coaches for this year and changes in the off season? He keeps them and maybe replaces them as they leave for other opportunities like it just seems like an awkward situation for him to come and have this pre-made assistant coach staff you know in in a competitive sort of uh playoff run like the hawks are doing yeah i mean i I, I, there's i see no other path for this year if he joins like right away and kind of takes the helm right away this is his staff you know I, i can't imagine could he bring one person that you know has is available right now? I mean, one it seems like a maybe, but more than that seems completely impractical. Just I mean, him coming on is going to be even if it's a positive move. I think it would be. You know, it's going to be disruptive enough. You know, especially coming out of the the change from kind of Nate stepping out and and and, and all that. So I you know I think he inherits what he has for the most part, and then at the end of the season, kind of figures out what makes sense to keep, what makes sense to not keep, and you know what he uh, he kind of wants to bring in and kind of turn a decent amount of it over is, is the way I think it would go. Brad, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, I've talked, I've tried to talk about it a ton because it's such an interesting situation. Like I have a bunch of research I've been doing. It's essentially unprecedented. Like from what I can find of yep. a team is a team as good as the, not that the Hawks have been playing great this year, but they're, they're 500. They're in the middle of playoffs. Teams that do the teams that are this good, quote unquote, don't make these external moves this late in the season. Like you can find teams that have been good when they made the moves, but they always, they, they always come earlier in the season. Like the guy gets fired after 10 games or something. Mike Brown's one or D- D'Antoni took over in, in, in LA because Mike Brown got fired in, in, like, in like a week. Like if that counts, then okay. But it's usually when teams do this, it's usually bad teams like that are not trying. And it's because in part of what you're talking about, like it's awkward, like just simply put that you bring this guy in. I'm sure he knows some of these guys on the bench, but they're not his guys. I mean, Joe Prunty's been around forever. I'm sure that him and Chris Sider have talked at some point in their lives, but that's not his guy. I mean, and uh, yeah, do you, you you bring like Lindsay, I think maybe, maybe you bring one guy in, but you, there's this world, like I think Hawks fans, some people anyway, think that, like this could be like this, this cleaning of house. Like that's not going to happen. Like he, no. it's, it's not, it's not practical. Like you can't bring in a whole, because guy, by the way, Quinn's guys are probably on stabs other places. Like right. guys are not just chilling unless they, I mean, Quinn's got he got he has head coach money. His assistants probably don't have head coach money <laughs> to be sitting yeah. around all season long. So, yeah, I think it would be a little bit strange. I'm sure there's been conversations between Landry Fields and um, and the staff. I think he talked about the fact that he talked. He basically just told Joe Prunty to stay on task. But they those guys all know like if you bring in a coach ahead of them, they're coaching for their jobs. And you know, realistically, is Quinn Snyder going to come in? keep this staff this year and then not, not let anybody go next year. I can't, I mean, that just be a little bit strange. So it's just this yeah. looming dynamic. It's kind of a challenge. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just one of those things that you have to consider. Yeah. And I, I would think it has to help that Joe Prunty has been through this before, right? He was the interim after Jason Kidd was let go in Milwaukee and, um, and that has to help him, you know, to, to know what it's like to be in a temporary kind of, seat for a while and things like that so and and he's you know well, well respected around the league and, and it's not like the hawks don't have any good assistant coaches it's not, it's not like their whole you know that's not kind of the situation i just think um you know I, nate uh, kind of has his way of doing things and he needed his staff to kind of fit into his way of doing things and i think that potentially with the change that like, they'll have a um, a model where things are more open and you know and and not so rigid and and things like that and that might even allow the current coaching staff to contribute in ways that they maybe weren't able to do before. And, and yeah, we're not here to throw Nate under the bus or, you know, or whatever, you know, and things like that. But I mean, everyone kind of knows he's consistent, <laughs> you know? So uh, and that, and, that, that and has pros and cons. That's a generous, it's a generous word. I, I, honestly, I think if you, uh, I think the three of us are probably the, the the ones locally that would be most set up to be at least kind of charitable to Nate, not not in a way that says 
I, I'm fine with them moving on. It doesn't bother me at all. I think that Nate has his weaknesses. But, you know, if you looked around, uh, <laughs> you would have thought that Nate was the worst coach in the history of the National <laughs> Basketball Association in the last couple of days <laughs> by the reaction. So I, I understand. It's what, But, yeah, it, it's a very different thing. And, honestly, I don't, I don't think Joe Prunty has a reputation of being this, like, dynamic guy either and it's just, maybe i'm wrong but i it feels like no. he's not and not in a bad way he's he's kind of the archetype of a, of a long time assistant that's been a, around and he's not that old but he's been around for a long time he's been doing this for a long time but even he like you got to see the way we talked about at the very beginning of this like his fingerprints and things he wants to do differently and he wants to take more threes like the fact the fact that he just said that just kind of casually like hey i'd like to see them take more threes like that's a new that's a new thing um and he has his own ideas like guys on stabs you know, you can't just assume that you're going to overhaul everything, but at the same time, Joe Prunty undoubtedly thinks differently than David Millen does about, about something. I don't know what it's going to be, but something. I mean, there's, nobody's in lockstep, and it wasn't like Prunty's been around, next to Nate his entire career. He's worked for Nate before, but he's been other places about Nate. Like, it's not like this, he's a Nate right. disciple, so it's going to be different. Yeah, and I mean, and you know, they've done some better things on defense this year. And Longabardi, you know, I I think has his fingerprints are kind of showing up around there and things like that. And I I've said the, to both of you guys before. I think a lot of Matt Hill. I think I think he was kind of brought into USA basketball for there's it's not for no reason that he's kind of been invited and kind of into that space. So, it, you know, I I think Quinn would kind of test drive this staff the rest of the way, see what he has, see how he feels at, at the end of the year see how much continuity he wants and what that would look like and, and kind of make his decisions um, from there. Um, you know, Kevin, you've been, in, well, you both guys have been kind of around the, the team for a while and you've been closer to it than I have. Landry talks about Quinn's kind of relationship building and, and rapport and things like that. And that obviously would be, uh, that's different than old school coaches, not just Nate. Right. Um, but is that kind of a, um, is that something you guys picked up on when you, when Quinn was on staff and you had any kind of chance to kind of hear players? I know, like Dennis talked about, um, I think Kenny a lot, right? Kenny Atkinson a lot. Did you were, did guys talk about Quinn when he was an assistant? And were there kind of consistent things that you guys heard about Quinn when he was around and um, working with Bud? That actually predates me. Uh, my oh, does it? I, yeah, that was like the ripe of like months before. I started covering the Hawks was when Quinn Snyder was around. So there was some Quinn okay. Snyder talk, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people referred to him, but he was already in Utah by the time I was, I was on. Yeah. I was actually, and just to throw out factoids here, uh, <laughs> I was, I was just checking uh, to see like if Prunty and uh, Snyder had any overlap and they, they did not, but they were, were, were within a couple of years ago with the Spurs franchise with Prenti leaving the uh, parent team a couple of years before Snyder came in with the Spurs G league team. Hmm. So they may have some familiarity, uh, but we'll have to see. Yeah. I mean, and they, I'm I mean, sure just it's... NBA circles in general. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and Landry's the... a bit of a bridge probably too, for those guys. Right. By the way. Yeah, probably. I mean, and, and with Quinn, you know, he was only around for a year. So it's, it's interesting. Right. Like, he has the bud shine because he was on that staff, but he wasn't like around like as long as Darwin was or as long as even Kenny was like, he was just, but there was a, he got a lot of, uh, a lot of shine. I mean, he got hired off the Hawks bench. Like that was his stop before Utah. So they saw something there and it was honestly, candidly, I put myself, this is 10 years ago. Now when I'm thinking about it, like, I think my first thought when they hired Quinn Snyder the first time was like, wait, you mean the guy from Missouri? Like that, that's how I knew Quinn Snyder was his college <laughs> stuff. And that had been previous years before that. But I think he, he was pretty renowned being around the team then, like, as an offensive mind. I think he got a lot of – not a lot of credit necessarily. Like, it was Bud's system, but guys liked a lot of what Quinn ran. And his rep his rep as an offensive – I think that's what he kind of got him the Utah job was, like, he had this rep as, like, an offensive wizard or how many, whatever word you want to say that. And um, – that's kind of what I remember being talked about the most, but um, like, like it, was, it was short enough where he didn't have, I didn't have the same interaction level with him. I might've talked to him a few times when he was on staff for sure, but it wasn't like it was for Darvin or even Charles Lee or Taylor Jenkins. Those guys were just here longer than Quinn was. I know it's, it's funny, Brad, you said, I knew him from his college stuff and my mind went back to his college playing days. Him, play, him I, playing I, I guy. Because I'm old <laughs> enough to remember him at Duke. Um, uh, you know, there and and everything. So that's, that's kind of funny. <laughs> one one point that I've seen made about Quinn Snyder 
in 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 some of the stuff that's been around is that and, and it, Brad mentioning that he was only here in Atlanta for one season. Jar, my memory on this was that uh, he's been in a lot of places, you know, for some of those short stints, but he was always there for year one. Like when he was, uh, when he was with the Lakers, it was year one under Mike Brown. When he was, uh, you know, with the Hawks, it was year one under Mike Budenholzer. Uh, when, you know, when he, when he went to Utah, of course he was creating things from the ground up there. So he's, he's been in a lot of situations, uh, where there wasn't a lot of continuity where they were kind of put, trying to instill a program, kind of build it from the ground up. So he has sort of experience and program building, uh, from a lot of the stops that he's had, even as like an I, assistant. I just realized this. This is just kind of random. Did you, did you guys understand that Quinn Snyder is older than Joe Prunty? I mean, yeah, I, I, I could see that. Part of it is like when you see Prunty uh, pregame, you know, he, he's sort of an older looking fellow, but like, uh, you know, he's got a young family. Uh, yeah, he's and, not. And so I mean, it jars your memory. Oh, yeah, he's he just older than he, you know, he looks older than he is for sure. And he's been around for a long time too. It's just one of those things where I think Quinn still has, for whatever reason, some of that like view that he's maybe a little bit younger than he actually is. He's been six years old. He's not, he's, it's not, it's not a, I mean, he's been around for a long time and yeah. it's not super old for a head coach in the NBA, but I think he maybe is still viewed as this maybe younger guy than he actually is. He's, he's a seasoned guy. I mean, he's in his mid fifties. He's, he'd be the oldest guy on their staff right now. Like he, he become, if he came in today, he'd be, he'd be the oldest, the elder statesman on the staff. So <laughs> by, by a lot, Notable. by a lot. He's older than me. So that's all I know. That, that's it. That, that's, <laughs> well, that's a heck of a, well, a, heck of a I hadn't right thought there. of it that way. Wow. Whew. Wow. He's uh, he's over he's over the hill. I've taken up a lot of you guys' time. I'm, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> you're really, you you're talking. really not. We're, I mean, there's a yeah, lot to process, no, and we'll be yeah. processing for weeks. How do, so I I probe this. I'm not sure how much anyone else has, but I find the possibility of Quinn and Trey collaborating. I'll use that word. Interesting to see how that will go. I. On the surface, I'm like, is Trey really going to enjoy like the way Quinn approaches coaching? A lot of detail oriented stuff. Um, he's he he really is um, really wants to see like the game executed in a. In, I mean, and Trey as an offensive, intuitive, instinctive, like just genius, right? I think he relies on a certain amount of freedom for him to be able to kind of see what he sees and make the decision he and so i just find kind of their stylistic differences to be something that kind of makes me go hmm i wonder how that would work are, are you guys having a similar reaction to me when you kind of think about that or or is that just me do you want me to say you want to go kevin I'll, I'll i'll just say we talked about this before glenn you and i you actually put that in my head and i think it makes a lot of sense like because i think because quinn coached donovan mitchell in the most recent stop I think people are kind of overlooking that early in that tenure, he was, it was much, it was much more bud ball. Like they ran a lot more egalitarian offense than yeah. they did by the end when it was a lot of Donovan. And I think it probably would be more like that with Trey. Cause Trey is just so good that you kind of have to do that, but I, it'd be very different. You know, I think Nate gets this reputation as like this taskmaster, where he's really not, he's, he's, he's definitely a, he's definitely an old school guy. But he's not a he's not a scream at you guy necessarily. He's not a. Uh, I know you kind of use it jokingly, the sociopath thing with Quinn. I think Quinn is much more intense than Nate, and that will be. Uh, I I don't I actually don't know how Trey will respond to that because it's more like maybe like Lloyd was at times, um, not necessarily the same, and obviously more gravitas as more experience than Lloyd had. But uh, it's a different personality for sure, from what I understand. I mean, being around him and also just kind of hearing around the league in the last couple of days, like hey. Tell me about Quinn. People that come, people that cover the Jazz, and uh, he's he, he's not a mess around guy. He's very he's very intense and very matter of fact. And I wonder like how that'll work too with Trey. Kevin, uh, I think it's an interesting contrast because, like, on the one hand, I do think it's going to be a very different sounding voice. Like, there's an intensity that's going to come with Quinn Snyder, and and you know, Trey is going to have to hear the message and the substance of the message over maybe the style of the message if he doesn't necessarily like the style but at the same point like trey's trey's a basketball savant like he gets it yep. <laughs> like he's devoted his life to basketball like whatever age trey is 25 whatever you know however old he is like he's devoted this and a half, un- 
ungodly disproportionate proportion of his life to basketball at the expense of all other things. And I think that he appreciates genius. Like, and, and, and I think when you get to that level, you know, I think it's sort of talent appreciates talent. So yeah. he's looking for elite coaching talent. And I think there might be some level where if he thinks this guy gets it, like there, there's a lot here I can learn because I know that this guy gets it. I think at that point, he will look past the style of the message and into the substance of the message. Yeah, I, th- I think that's I think that's possible. I, th- I think that I think for me, you all know I'm I'm an optimist. Like there's an opportunity for for trade to kind of step into a different kind of coaching context and kind of a, a bit of a different structure and a dynamic there. And when you hear people around the league talk about what players want from their coaches, number one, it's like who can help me get to the, the highest level, right? Who can help me get to the highest level? And Trey doesn't have really anything else to prove offensively. And I've talked before like how I appreciate his extra effort and better execution on defense this year. And tonight he was great as low man. He was early. He knew, you know, you know, we don't have to go back to kind of breaking down the, 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 tonight's game again. Oh, no, that's good. But but and but maybe the timing is right. Maybe 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 Quinn's ready for that and, and, and Trey's ready for that. And and we'll see. You know, I have to say, um, you know, I wrote a piece on Peace Tree Hoops when Travis kind of, you know, moved on that there wasn't uh, a glowing uh, um, piece about where the Hawks organization was. And I didn't say they can't do X, they can't do Y, I can't do Z. I basically said nothing really matters until they kind of stabilize the organization. What, what's the model? Who's making decisions, et cetera. But for me, I thought they did well the deadline, mostly in the form of not making a panic move, not forcing themselves to make a move, a bad move. And then if if this is kind of the next big thing, if they get Quinn, I got I got to kind of say they've kind of gone two for two. <laughs> if this is kind of how this this plays out, so um, it's not what I expected, um, but it you know a couple of pleasant surprises. So we can talk about whether they sent out too many picks to bring back the players at the deadline. But the they I think like I thought they got the big stuff right at the deadline in the form of not making a bad move, not making a forced move, not you know not making a panic move. And now if they get Quinn, who is, I think broadly accepted as the kind of the best coach that seems to be available right now, hard to, hard to criticize for me. All right. Well, Brad, you made it all the way from beginning to end. I appreciate you sticking it out. I, the- I was, st- I was staring at the window to be throw, throw out of this office that I'm in. It's not my office, but no one, no, no one ever came. So I just decided to stay all the way through. <laughs> I mean, it's the middle of the night, unless it's like security. I don't think anybody's coming to use it. Thank you for having me, fellas. I, oh. I appreciate you, let, you letting me drop by to drop bombs on this podcast. And this is it a was- great show, everybody. Please subscribe to this podcast. You're listening to right now. It's 29. The best. Brad Rowland. What a treat. Uh- Very, very good. Thanks, guys. Thank you.